Hello, thanks for tuning in. My name is Amira Shakur, and I am the Program Associate with the Women's Democracy Network. I'm, in, I'm joined today by Dr. Reka Smarkini, Transatlantic Senior Advisor at IRI, to bring you the next episode of Fireside Chats. I'd like to join Reka in welcoming this episode's featured guest, Her Excellency Ivan Abaki, Ambassador of Ecuador. Thank you so much for joining us today. How are you? I'm great. It's a pleasure to be here with you. What an honor for me to be in the Women's Democracy Network and the Fireside Chat. chat. I mean, that's fantastic. <laughs> Wonderful to have you. Thank you so much for, uh, for accepting it. Uh, it is a very special honor and pleasure to have you in our uh, chat series and discussions because um, there is, there's very few more inspiring persons who have met than you. So thank you so much for this time and the uh, um, uh, availability. Um, if I may say as a short introduction, because of course it's impossible to um, really uh, say everything that I would like to, uh, but as a top diplomat of your country, in addition to being an artist, a painter, uh, you are also a very impressive and very inspiring peace negotiator, a humanist and a politician. Um, a person with a university degrees from Sorbonne and Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, you speak five languages, um, and that's just the start. Uh, you have, during already your time at Harvard, you uh, created a, a fantastic initiative, the Harvard Arts for Peace Foundation, uh, which uh, was aimed at organizing joint exhibitions and art shows between countries in war. At the same time, you created the Beyond Boundaries Foundation, which helped uh, focused on eradicating river blindness in Ecuador and continues to fight diseases, tuberculosis, and diabetes up until our days. In addition, you have a fantastic commitment to peace uh, and an incredible um, um, series of fruits in this effort. Between 1994 and 97, uh, you were a member of the board of director, uh, directors of Harvard's uh, conflict management group and participated in conflict resolution meetings around the world. Uh, you have participated in the success uh, of Ecuador of the Ecuador-Peru peace agreement, which was signed in 1998, as advisor to the president of Ecuador at the time. And uh, then you were, you were nominated ambassador to the United States, where you continue to work on uh, fighting drug trafficking, for instance, through, uh, through the Indian Trade Preferences Agreement, uh, and in several uh, other important initiatives. Um, your attitude to the world is also shown by the fact that whenever there's a problem, you, you go there and create a solution. In uh, 2001, after the spill of the oil tanker, Jessica, in the Galapagos Islands, you created the Galapagos Cons uh, Conservancy Foundation uh, um, for protecting the environment. And no wonder that you have received several awards and um, uh, recognitions for this. Uh, in addition to, the, to this work for humanitarian and peacemaking causes, causes um, you were running for as candidate for the presidency to, sh to really commit uh, in the political life of your country. So I think, you know, and then of course you were, sorry, the first woman minister um, um, of uh, uh, trade, industry and regional integration in your country. So, I mean, we could enumerate these things. It's so fantastic and so inspiring uh, that I uh, just could not be happier to have you uh, here. Um, let me jump into some of the questions that, I mean, there is a zillion that I would like to ask from you, and I think would be all very helpful to, to have your insights on. But let me start at the beginning, okay? For instance, you know, uh, when you first um, committed to, um, uh, to a cause that you believed in, what did you feel like, what was the most difficult impediment? Was it, um, more difficult? Did you see any difficulty in this uh, first uh, job or first commitment um, to go ahead um, because it was a for uh, because it was a, an environment that was more difficult uh, for you uh, uh, than it would have been for men? Did you ever had that Im experience or impression? Yeah. First, Rekha, thank you very much for your introduction and for mentioning those things that sometimes I forget how my life changed from being in the arts to being in politics and being um, in negotiations for peace. But mostly, I mean, if, if you ask me the questions you just asked, 
I don't think I felt um, I felt that as a problem. Um, that I felt that by being a woman, it was difficult for me to enter because um, I had very much support. I mean, my support, the family, the background, my, my father was very supportive of me that uh, not as a woman or man, as a boy or girl, but always pushing me for things to do. My mother, the unconditional love. So, um, and I never put a goal to reach to something. It just came. It, by doing, I always say that it's the process, not the end result for me that moves me, motivates me. Um, and my life changed because of the war in Lebanon. You know, uh, I, was, I was born in Ecuador, uh, but uh, in a young age, we went to visit my, my mother's family in Lebanon and, uh, and we stayed there. I uh, married with the Lebanese, my children were born in Lebanon, and the war started in Lebanon. And it was the worst war imaginable. It's civil war inside. It's not in, in, in the borders and the frontier. It's in the cities. You never know when the bomb comes and kills people without any, any, any notice. And, uh, and I, I, my children will go to school. I don't even know if they come back or not. Our apartment was bombarded seven times. So you learn to live the moment. Uh, and this is what changed my life. And I went into the arts at that moment because as a woman in that moment, it was different, difficult for me to be in politics, especially in the Middle East. My husband was in politics. Um, he was a businessman, but also a politician. And, and I couldn't interfere. I was very young. I, I married, I was 17 or 16, even not even 17. I had three children at the age of 21. And, and I couldn't say it in words what I felt at that moment, being, seeing people being killed in front of me and couldn't do anything so I started painting it was through paintings and music classical music and painting and I, I will make women most of my paintings were women and horses and a symbol of of, 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 of peace and love unconditional love for the women and the horses of freedom and always I would put the, the head of the horse would be a woman with the so it was it was an expression of of how I felt at that moment and especially when I saw women suffering the eyes of the woman, you will see one of the paintings, for example, you will see the suffering at the same time, the hope and being unable to say something. So it was through the art that I started. But this took me to Harvard afterwards as an artist in residence to Harvard University. And I realized that the only way to do something is to be also in politics in order to make a difference. You cannot as an artist, I would say, oh yes, she's talking, but she's an artist. But once you, you, you'll be able to, 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 to be in politics, you could make more. And that's why I entered the Canada School of Government and I did my master's in public administration and public policy, but I never left the arts. I was the artist in residence at Harvard. I created the Arts for Peace Foundation. We were doing exhibitions, the art for politics, how through the arts you can help unite people beyond boundaries of race, of religion, of color, of, of, of language. So this was usually whatever I was doing always. And that's, that's when I get to, to, to be with Roger Fisher at the conflict management group, because I wanted to make peace in the world. That was my aim in the Middle East, the peace in the Middle East between Israel and Palestine. That was my dream to make something like that. And I thought as a woman, they will take me more serious when I have my diploma. And then I will be in the conflict management. I was member of the board of directors of the conflict management group. We started negotiation with peace with real people from Palestine and Israel that we come to Harvard and real negotiations, live negotiations. And this took me to the moment afterwards with Peru and Ecuador, because uh, in 1995, we had a border dispute that was very old, but it was a war between the two sides at that moment. And the president of Ecuador in 1995, Sixth Uran called me and I was at home, look at the coincidence, there's always a cause. I was at home at night having dinner with all the group of the conflict management group with Roger Fisher, Professor Fisher with us too. And he called the president and he said, Yvonne, please, we, we have to reach Professor Fisher and the conflict, we need to bring them to Ecuador for, for finding a way to find a solution between the two sides, the two countries. And I told the president, he is here, you can ask him immediately. <laughs> so he took the phone when one week later we were in Ecuador with the group of the conflict management. And, um, and that's when my life, my life changed. We started the negotiations. 
uh, with both sides. Uh, in 1995, 1998, we had a historic uh, agreement signing between the two countries and the guarantor countries were United States, Chile, Argentina, and Brazil. Uh, so it was a historic signing ceremony on October 26, 1998. And then I was appointed ambassador to the United States and my art was <laughs> in a stop by, a standby because I couldn't paint. So I haven't painted since then. And it's been one thing after the other, but I never felt that there's an impediment by me being woman. It was at the beginning maybe, but then to be taken seriously, you have to have something um, and not, but never be insecure about it and never change your position, your feminine side into something masculine, because this is the, 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 the power of woman is our femininity, our different way of thinking, not becoming like men. When we sit at the table of negotiations, a woman sees always a solution mm -hmm. through getting everybody together and seeing every side, putting yourself and the other. The men, they say, this is what I want and I don't change. So women is, we have to have the woman in the table of negotiations to find a solution. I was at that time, the only woman in the table of negotiations. And even being one, you can make a difference. Imagine if we were more, we would not have problems in the world if we had more women in positions of power to make a difference. That's so wonderful. <laughs> Absolutely, so true. I have worked in security policy for 30 years and I feel the same way that tackling these uh, very hard conflicts among countries and, and nations and cultures and, and peoples, you do need more women at, around the table because the approach is so wonderful and, and your life really shows a fantastic example of how much impact a single woman can can make so absolutely you were ambassador uh, you were ambassador to the united states too i mean you were ambassador here and you know how difficult it is but at the same time it opens doors being a woman yeah it is true but i was struck by also the fact that how you 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 saw that coming into a different environment at harvard or in the united states from having gone through the experience of war in lebanon and that's when you you, you have a perspective or you have a, a, a different view on, on how, what you can do or how you can go forward. Uh, that's how you, you went over to politics to be taken seriously and get a degree. And I think it is absolutely true and very, uh, very important also what you say that, you know, the, um, the knowledge and the uh, expertise that you can gain uh, is a, a very solid foundation to be taken seriously uh, mm -hmm. afterwards. It's very, very interesting. Um, did you ever have a person, I mean, maybe your parents or, or a person who you would see was a, a mentor for you or, or, um, or someone who, who was supporting you or, or would you have wished for one? Um, I had, as I told you, I had my parents, my mother, unconditional love that gives security when you have parents that are really the love uh, and the discipline. She was very disciplined and very strict in things, but loving. Uh, and my father was the motivator, the one that pushed us. I was the eldest daughter. We had, my brothers are younger. So I had, we are we were three, three, three daughters, three sisters. And uh, I have two sisters and two brothers. So I was the eldest. So he wanted to have a boy and I come. So he was treating me, not as a woman, not as a boy, giving me responsibilities since I was young. And he believed in me very much. And I was lucky to marry a person that was like my father and beyond, <laughs> even more, more. He gave me more security. He taught me everything. When I went to, Le to Lebanon, I spoke only Spanish, uh, very little English because in school there, they didn't teach us uh, much, many languages. But of course, in Lebanon, my mother took the opportunity. We were there to put us in school. And there you have to learn English, French, and Arabic to be able to study in college university even school you need three languages so I was obliged to learn and then my husband perfectionated because he was a perfectionist that how important languages are are good to be spoken in the right way with the right accent and so he was and then pushing me for everything that I did I continued my studies being married with ch children so if you, I didn't have the support of my husband he was my mentor in everything he was amazing uh, and and he, he believed in me more than I believe in myself. <laughs> he thought I could be not only the president of Ecuador, but for the world. That was really, it, it gives you the security that somebody like that, a man from the Middle East, 
believes in, in a woman. And he will tell me always, what I couldn't do, you will do. Really? So be ready, be ready. And this is something. And take risks. Be ready, prepare yourself, be secure that nothing is impossible, that everything you want is only in the mind. It's your mind that tells you you can't. But nothing is impossible if you want to do it. It's only take the risk, because if you don't do it, you will not know if it's possible or not. So, um, yes, this were my yeah. That because is amazing. This is so, so, so uh, inspiring. Um, you, you, uh, one thing also struck me very much that I would like you to go back to, which you mentioned just a, a few minutes ago, that uh, we sh uh, women should not forget their femin femininity. They should not be, become like men. They should not start thinking like men. Um, but this is the advantage that they have, and this is the extra, the additional that they, they can bring to it. Did you have that? Did you have that? feeling throughout that it was always a benefit or did you sometimes have it it was it was bringing additional difficulties as well in your That's career a very good question Rekha because you know nobody answered asked me in that way the question I never wanted to change the way I look and my children are supportive of me in everything and they push me the boys especially I have two boys the eldest one and a girl and the boys always push me not to change the way I am. I am um, impulsive in a way, and I, I show my emotions. And that's something that Roger Fisher, Professor Fisher, was telling me always in negotiation, don't show too much of your emotions. And I told him, no, sometimes you have to do it. And then uh, uh, he, he realized that it's true. So when he wrote his last book, it was negotiating with emotions. Wow. <laughs> How important it is. Sometimes you should show your emotions and open your cards. But the, the thing I had a problem of my physical part, uh, when I was running for director general for UNESCO, that was in 2009. And uh, my son Faisal, my second son, he was with me. And I remember that you have to be for a certain age. And I was that age, but maybe I looked younger at that time, I don't know, um, that the persons that were uh, advising me there, the woman, one woman came and she said, we have to take the picture for the UNESCO brochure. Uh, for a candidate, but you have to change your looks. And I said, what? She said, you have to change the color of your hair, make it some white, put some white in it and score and cut it. And cut your hair or make it in a chignon, make it so that you will look older and more, more, more I don't know, more serious for the, for the job because they want somebody over, not less than 58, you cannot. And I was, I was at that time. <laughs> So anyway, I said, I said, okay, I, I, I didn't think, you know, my son came, she said, no way. I prefer my mother to lose that position than to change herself. Nobody will touch what she is. She has to be accepted the way she is. And if she's not, she's not. It means that this institution doesn't, be, doesn't belong to her. So, so, <laughs> so that was one of the episodes that I think the only one, the only one that in fact, when I was running for president of Ecuador, I was dressed in a certain way that maybe at that time, because it was the first time somebody was running for president, a woman, and I used to wear trousers that were tight and they will criticize sometimes. And I will say, uh, because my children were supporting me always. And I will say, I am, I am a woman, but I have the trousers very tight to me. I, I have the trousers, I'm uh, good. Uh, bien, los pantalones bien puestos. Los pantalones bien puestos. <laughs> I don't know how to say it in English, but it's wearing your trousers well. So <laughs> it means that, yeah, because sometimes they criticize, you know, that, oh, it's this woman that's very young and she wants to run for president and, and she's dressed like a man. And I was not, I'm, I was dressing, they were saying that it's too, but anyway, these are the two events that I felt that it was a little bit, but you have to, you have to come out. You have to say, no, this is what I am. And this is what you have to accept the way you are, the way I am. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it, this is the only two incidents that I ever find. Maybe when I was also in Lebanon at the beginning, I was very, very young when I got appointed as an honorary consul, consul in Lebanon. Um, and I was the only woman being consul. I was maybe 23 years old. Um, and I was uh, entering a room or all the, the consuls were men, an older man, and they started complimenting me on my hair, on my dress, on my... And I told him, oh, how beautiful your tie is. Your hair looks great, but you should put the head because you have no hair or something, <laughs> things like that. 
And I told them at the end, that's what you do when you get together. That's why you don't, you don't get anything done because you complement each other only. I made it as something, giving it back, you know? So <laughs> we started working together. It was the best group of the consuls in order at that time. And the war started during the time that we were consuls and I was consul there. So yeah, it was an experience, but I never took it personally. I never got um, um, upset about it or resentful or answering in a way that was... Um, negative you, you have to you have to manage yeah it's uh, it is so true <laughs> it is very uh, very uh, inspiring also um how did you get that first nomination that was your first um, um nomination for uh yeah um, it, when i was for council for con yes I, no, I, I, it, was, it was the president of ecuador wanted to put my father in lebanon as an honorary council my father said no i want my daughter to be <laughs> she will be a better consul than me so he didn't want to be in politics at all never so he put <laughs> and it was interesting because i had a great experience doing that because the war in lebanon started and all the consulates and all the embassies we didn't have an embassy of ecuador in, in lebanon we had a consulate it was so uh, all the embassies and all the latin american um, consulates in fact all the international uh, all the embassies and consulates were closed the only one that was open was the ecuadorian so I had to deal with many of the problems of the other embassies that will tell me to help them when they were kidnapped. They were kidnapping a lot of Latin American uh, uh, people. So I was helping in that. So it was a great experience to deal with, uh, negotiate with the leaders, the political leaders, uh, the Shias, uh, the, the groups that they were taking, the Hezbollah, Amal. So there were different groups at that time that you had to negotiate with and to get the, the kidnaps taken back. Back. I'm, I'm sure you were the only woman negotiating with them oh, yes. on this. Yeah, absolutely. And I had the support of my husband all the time. And he knew all these politicians and he would let me, you go alone. <laughs> they, were, they, were, they were struck. How can this, at that time, you know, it was in the 70s, uh, very little woman. There were no, no woman where it was in any political position in Lebanon at that time. At that time. Wow. How did that feel? I don't know. I, did, I never felt anything. That's what I'm saying. I, I was so <laughs> secure because of of my, my family, because of my, my husband, because I was so secure that I didn't feel, I feel natural. I was doing it and I was saying the way I feel and I feel to say the word love, I will say it. You are lacking love, I will tell them. You man, you don't have feelings. That's why you go into this kind of horrible things that you're doing and, and arms. And my husband, I never let, because you know, when he was in politics, they gave him arms and security and all this. I never let one arm enter my home, forbidden. And once they came to kidnap my son, I had my first son at the beginning and they came to kidnap me. They wanted my husband, but he, he was out at home. And I was with my son and the two girls that worked for me from Ecuador. And they didn't want to, I, I said, don't open the door. But they were knocking, they were going to break the door. So I opened the door and there were 17 young, very young people with Kalashnikovs and M16. And you, you can imagine all of them. They wanted to, my husband, I said, he's not here. I said, well, your son, we heard that you have a son. We are going to, to enter and see. I said, you over my body, you will pass over me. I was only 19 years old. Yeah, not even, I think that before. But anyway, um, over my body, you pass with this. And, uh, and then, I knew that something is going to happen. There were, there were orders. Uh, so I look at one of them, the one that looked to be the leader, and he looked like my age. He looked like this, and he had beautiful blue eyes and, and young. And I said, what the, I told him, you are the leader of them. I want to talk to you. That was my third lesson of negotiations because my son, I told him, you will kill me before you enter. Uh, so I told him, okay, you can come in, leave your arms outside. Close the door and come inside. <laughs> and I started talking with him. And telling, asking him why he's doing this. And he said, because I lost my, my parents in the, in the, in the war. And, uh, and, um, and I have my brothers and sisters very young. And I need to, to help them. And I don't have means. This is the only way now to do something. So then we give you, we, you will be, we have the foundation, me and my husband, the foundation for helping people. Um, and I told him, we'll help you. We'll help you and we'll get you much more than what you're getting now. And you'll be clean in the, instead of doing these bad things. But tell them to go and I'll, I'll arrange and give me your, your, your phone number and all this. And he became, he, he was working for us for all the time. Afterwards, he will take my children to school. <laughs> what an incredible story, my goodness. That's so quite a lesson about negotiations. This, this is what love makes, you know. 
Mm-hmm. A mother, a mother can never give up doing something. Yeah. Like yes. So this is the unconditional yeah. love that women have. That's why they have to be more women in positions of change, especially in places where there's there are wars. And now the world is becoming like a whole war. The yeah, pandemic, is a, pandemic is a war. Yeah, it is a war, and I think we have so many conflicts and so many arising on the. Uh, That's really a time for for absolutely women with love to be yeah. in it. It's uh, so so true. Okay, I have one question about organizations, women's organizations, because uh, I would like to be. Uh, I am very interested, and I would like to have your opinion about it. If you have seen women's professional organizations uh, at all, or have you seen them to be helpful, or do you think it is um, uh, it would be helpful um, for for women? you know, the beginning maybe of their career or, or as they go ahead? It is helpful. It, it is very helpful. I think from the beginning and even at the end, it's helpful. But as long as is, as I'm saying, be yourself. And I would prefer to have women and men in the organizations of women. I think men should defend women. It's like men's, do organ- you see any men's organization? You don't see men, but they are only men. <laughs> we are women, we call it ourselves. We say the first uh, woman's bank, the first, I don't know, always, you don't have the first man bank, <laughs> for example. <laughs> so, so instead of having, I know you have the woman, the fire, the women's democracy network. Okay, but you should have men too. It would be very helpful to have, that's the only thing I think it would be helpful if you have, m- name it like that, but have men and women working together. <laughs> Uh, it would be better as a form of s- support for, for women if you have men giving their opinion too mm-hmm. and seeing how important the role of women is and how wonderful it would be if we, if we have 50-50 in everything. In every institution, we have the 50-50. I'm not very much co- in the quotas issue, but it's a well a beginning. It's good to start with quotas, but I believe it should be 50-50. No mm-hmm. quotas, just say we are half of the of humanity, I mean. It's it's even more. They say 51 women to 49 yeah. men. So if we want to be correct, absolutely. Yeah, 50, 50. <laughs> And we're getting, getting there. We're getting there. We're getting there. Absolutely. I think, I think soon it will be men asking for their rights. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly hope so. I have one last question. I don't want to keep too much, take too much of your time, and it's really fascinating to have this chance to discuss with you. So my uh, last question would be, you know, what would you give as three main pieces of advice? You have said a number of fantastic points already, so I noted them, and I think, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's been really already very helpful. Uh, but maybe if you could say, um, like, three most important things for women, w- would that be a... Um, what would be your yes. message? Yes, very good question. I think surround yourself with people that are positive, that motivate you, um, that are not negative, that they see the glass half full, not half empty. Um, the people that are negative is because of insecurities or because of they cannot, or because they are not surrounded with the right, or because they didn't have the, enough love in their parents. It doesn't mean that you don't have to help them. But if you want to be inspired, you need to have people that will inspire you, will help you, because everything is about motivation. It's about um, caring for something you love to do. Don't do something you don't like. If you wake up in the morning and you don't have passion to the work you're going to do it, do it don't do it. Always have to have this passion and this uh, energy, positive energy that you are doing something to make a difference. And we are here to serve each other and we are here to, to share what we have. Everything that we don't, we don't share, it's lost. If you don't share what you're doing, your knowledge, what you have or your wisdom, and you don't share it, it, you don't take it with you. It's not only material you have to share. You have to share also love. You have to share your, 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 your thoughts. Your, your, your education, your wisdom. What is wisdom? Wisdom, it, it's what's left after you have learned everything and forgotten everything. But then when you talk with somebody, you remember, so you give it. So you can give so much, Rekha. And I'm sure that Amira, who's here too, is giving a lot to, to, to your young generation. I mean, this, what you're doing, 
these chats are so important for that, you know, listen to this kind of things, learn from experience, not from only from books, from experience that you do and, and, and always be true to yourself and never believe when they tell you something is impossible because we don't use it except one or maybe 5% of what our brain can do. And the, 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 the power of the brain is, is limitless and you can break more glasses ever and ever, <laughs> more than what you think. So this is my message uh, and believe in yourself always. That is the most wonderful uh, message that we could end on our, uh, disc our discussion on. I really appreciate it tremendously and thank you so much. Yvonne, it's been so much a pleasure and so wonderful to have you. So thank, thank you, you so much for your advice, your insight, your wisdom for sharing it with us. And I really hope that many of our uh, participants can listen to you and many will be, all of them will be inspired by you. So thank you so much for this thank discussion. You, it's such a pleasure and an honor for me to be here with you. Thank you, all of you. Thank, thank you so much.